Inaritu back in our lives, man. Um, it, uh, were you itching to get some more Inaritu? Well, I don't know if I was itching for it, but at the same time, I really do like Birdman, and I really love The Revenant, his last two films. It's been a while since The Revenant, but you know, he, he won Best Director two times in a row, I think, justly for those two movies. And this is not what I would have wanted to see next in Bardo, but I really like to defend The Revenant. Some people kind of shit on it now. I was going to say. Make fun of the bear scene. I think that movie fucking rips. It looks amazing. Leo and Tom Hardy are so fucking good in it. I love that shit. It's like a frontier uh, movie, you know. And Birdman, I haven't seen it since it came out. Maybe the fake one visual aspect of it has faded from its spectacle at the time, but I remember enjoying that. You know, Emma Stone. You hate Twitter! You know, st- still still current. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what about you? H- how do you feel about his two most recent works? Obviously, Bardo is Inaritu's return to making a movie in Mexico for the first time in a long time. Yeah, I mean, we hadn't seen a, a big screen uh, thing from him in seven years. Revenant was 2015. Um, and he'd only done a, a short film um, in 2017, so really hasn't been doing a, a ton of stuff. Um, yeah, you know, both Birdman and The Revenant are movies that like I appreciate. Um, I think I, I would prefer The Revenant over Birdman, but um, I really liked the score of Birdman, like the like drums throughout or something that is like very memorable to me. But I, I don't think I necessarily was like, man, when are we getting Alejandro Inaritu back in our lives? Um, so for me, I wasn't like, fully anticipating this but when i heard he was dropping this movie i was like yeah, I, I definitely want to check it out it'll probably be pretty good and i don't know man bardo was was a tough watch for the most part for me i have to say once i think it's the kind of movie that you have to meet it on its own terms and once you meet those terms it clicks but if you have a hard time meeting those terms i think you're gonna have a rough time with this what about you yeah, well, I, I think the subtitle is actually super apt. Bardo, False Chronicle of a Handful of Truth. It's like, you know what? That's kind of what it feels like watching this movie, A False <laughs> Chronicle of a Handful of Truths, you know? It's like, ah, oh, if you, 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 you lean into it, you like kind of squint and you see it kind of thing. But, I mean, a lot's been made of the fact that this is another, like, autobiographical, the putting, director putting himself in the movie, in the story that we've gotten this year after Steven Spielberg's The Fablemans and James Gray's Armageddon Time. But the thing that seems to be a common refrain without this is that people have kind of knocked Inaritu's like self-importance as a voice for a while now. And Bardo is him leaning so far into that, right? It's literally about an artist like almost defending himself from from criticism of his work and his art and his career and being okay with being happy about what he's done and achieved and stuff. And it's like, I think that a lot of people just don't want to hear that from Inaritu, you know? And whether that's fair or not, I think that's just a sentiment you have in like the film community, unfortunately. Um, the thing that was like right away, like you watch this movie and it's super surrealist. It's super abstract. And that's just not what I was expecting going in and i think you have to try and like latch on to some of the moments where it's at least a bit more grounded because like i'm totally for like you know expression is like visual storytelling and stuff but i just i just don't know if like the the message really comes together to almost justify this movie kind of being all out there and stuff and like it, it did remind me a bit of some of the weirder scenes and Andrew Dominic's blonde, unfortunately, for that reason, where it's like, I just don't really understand what this is supposed to be doing. And like your plot mechanics are kind of like, like they're, they're, they're almost like too stilted and simple to justify this much like surrealist stuff. So I don't know. I, I definitely struggle with it a lot. It's a long movie, but even if it wasn't that long, I just had a hard time connecting with it. Unfortunately, I really wanted it to be good, but I don't think it's that great. You mentioned the length, and I think that makes some of the surreal stuff seem even harder to really sit with because it's very indulgent, right? And you think about, like, there's literally a moment near the end of the movie where, you know, we're going to spoil some plot points at this point, so if you want to, like, circle back, please do. Um, 
after he has a stroke and I think it's insinuated that he's going to die. He's like walking through the desert and like seeing his parents and his family's like kind of following him and he's telling them that, that they have to go back. And I literally was just like, oh my God, we get it. Like, I just was like, this, we've been sitting with this like idea of like, this is his death and he's moving away from like real life. He's in this desert. I was just like, I, I can't be with this anymore. Like, I just need this movie to end at this point. And I feel like there's a couple of moments like this, like uh, the loss of, of his uh, second son, Mateo. Um, a day after he's born is something that is like a, a major driver of character development and, and plot in the movie, right? Because there's even points where like, not only do they show Mateo's death and him actually being like put back in to, you know, the mother's womb in the, like the, one of the very first scenes, um, but it's called back to a second time, you know, when uh, the main character, hold on, I forgot his name. Um, uh, Sil- Silver Silverio. I don't know how I forgot that. Um, where Silverio and his wife uh, Lucia are making love, and he's going down on her, and then the baby's head pops out, and he pushes it back in, and it's just like, all right, like I understand that you're trying to get the idea of like their intimacy is impacted by this loss that kind of just like hangs over their relationship and their family, but holy smokes, like this is like really in in your face and like out there and not not very subtle you know and that's the thing is it it feels like some of this could have been way more subtle um but it's it's quite outlandish and really like hammering home some of this like metaphorical um, abstractionism like you mentioned um what 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 were like the because it's kind of like in vignettes of his life what were the vignettes that you liked more than others right well i think just quickly speaking to that subtlety point you mentioned right in the beginning where it's like he's like in the bathroom and he hears like the radio talking about how Mexico has agreed to sell the state of Baja California to the United States for the, for Amazon specifically. And I was like, wow, that is like super on the nose, but okay. But then it actually becomes like a continued, like furthering point in the story as we go. And it's like almost a way for him to, to connect to him having some guilt about leaving Mexico behind and emigrating to the U.S. and whatnot. I was like, yeah, man, this is, like, a bit on the nose. Like, I don't know if you have to be, like, Mexico selling Baja to Amazon, you know? It's, <laughs> Jesus Christ, at least yeah, think of something a bit more insightful. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it, in, in terms of the vignette I liked, I, I think in the beginning, like, when he goes to uh, the talk show that he used to mm. be involved at, the network or whatever, that was actually pretty cool. I thought the production design, the lighting looked really nice. And yeah. I'm always kind of there for like when the the lights come on and the host kind of switches up his energy on mm-hmm. the uh, the guest stuff like that. But that was probably the most effective thing to me. And like, cause, cause that was also like the most like grounded aspect of the early goings too. Yeah, no. Yeah. I, I thought that was really well shot. And I think that's actually something we have to give credit for is his his eye and his filmmaking is really cool. There's some beautiful, beautiful uh, cinematography in this. One of the, the shots that stands out most to me is when he's talking with his daughter in the like infinity pool at the resort that the family's at where they're when they're dropping Mateo's ashes off um, and they're they're discussing her like decision to leave Boston and come back to Mexico um, and the shot from behind where it's just him and his daughter looking out at the ocean in this pool. And then she like goes underwater and swims towards the camera. It's just like this incredibly beautiful and like moving shot. And I, I really was struck by that. But the other one, which is our, our background, if you're watching on YouTube is when he goes to the the dance club and it's kind of like this, uh, this longer vignette where it's him, you know, uh, having this movie, uh, that makes him famous this documentary that makes him famous being shown to the uh, talk show host confront i believe that was the same guy right the same talk show so. host yeah. that confronts him and is just like dressing him down about how like his creativity is like stolen and he's not actually that much of a genius and all this and then they go to this dance club with as a family and i think that dance club scene especially like you have david bowie um hmm. It playing and, and it's just like the, everything drops out but Bowie's voice and him just doing this amazing dance with a disco ball lighting the room it's just like incredible filmmaking one of my favorite like visual scenes of the year probably second second notable Bowie 
needle drop of the fall, of course, after Sun, Paul Mescal mm-hmm. really gets it on to the Bowie part of Under Pressure as well. So yeah, we're always down for a Bowie dance. Let, let, and I got I got to say Let's Dance is just an all-time classic. Um yep. uh, underrated song in my opinion. But um yeah, what were the the ones that you liked the least, the vignettes? Ah, uh, god, it's hard to say. Um <laughs> there's so many. <laughs> All the baby shit I didn't like. Um I don't know like <laughs> just to call it the baby shit makes me laugh. <laughs> you know, I was kind of there in the beginning where he's like he's talking to like the US ambassador, some like, you know, swarmy old white guy. Mm-hmm. And like next thing you know, he like envisions like the battle of uh, Ch- Chapultec, I think it is, you know, and like the concluding battles of the Mexican American War. And I was like, I just don't know like what this is supposed to communicate here. You know, it's like the, you guys are talking about the war of the past and you clearly see it in different ways as a Mexican and as an American. We get it. Mm-hmm. You have to like show like the conclusion of the, the battle. I, I just don't understand. And then like, I don't know, later on, he like, he, he's, he's communing with Cortez, the Spanish conquistador. And it's like, I don't know, man, like, I really struggle with the surreal shit, honestly, because like I don't know, I, maybe if I was more invested in the <clears throat> like the grounding plot, it would have been different. But I just wasn't. Yeah, I agree. I, the The battle didn't really work so well for me. Um, I'm trying to think of like the other moments that I, I think a lot of the stuff near the end, um, you know, like after he has the stroke and he's kind of like walking around, that that didn't really like sit very well or didn't really like meet me very well and then i think um you know like some of the stuff where he's in the house with his uh with his wife um after he comes home um after finding out he won the award and she's like you know you're you're talking without moving your your mouth or something like that and then she's like she's there then she disappears and then i I just was having a hard time following that and you mentioned the the baby aspect of it all when that pops back up in that i was really like i don't know (laughs) like i I feel like I might have to take a break from this movie. Um, I mean, we know Inaritu is going to make better stuff in the future, so not even like hopeful that he makes better stuff, but just that he mm-hmm. he finds some some sort of uh, I don't know idea or inspiration like like the Revenant that he can go back to and just uses his knack for filmmaking and storytelling in a different way. Yeah, but, I mean, bad beat for Netflix as well between Bardo yeah. and Noah Baumbach's White Noise. They didn't really find a best picture contender the way they've consistently done the past few years. It seems like this year didn't, they just, they, they picked the wrong horses this time. 